Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll present the results of the Sepsis Act on behalf of the uh, Trial Steering Committee listed here. And as for the uh, previous speaker, the uh, study will be published today uh, in the JAMA. As you may know, by definition, norepinephrine is the recommended first-line agent to restore the blood pressure in patients with septic shock. But it's not always effective, and we have refractory situation, and may be associated, like any other vasopressor, with uh, side effects. Vasopressin, on his hand, is recommended as a supplementary agent, uh, but also has multiple effects that may not be beneficial in the setting of septic shock, especially because of the activation of V1B or V2 uh, receptors. And you see on this slide the potential effect of activating VA1, VAB, or VA2, and what we're mostly looking for is the activation of VA1 to induce vasoconstriction, but also to get a vasoconstriction on the efferent glomerular artery and improved the glomerular filtration rate. Now, <clears throat> salipressin uh, had been used and tested already in preclinical study, but also in a small phase two trial a couple of years ago, and all these studies, preclinical and clinical, were consistent in terms of benefit of salipressin in the way it was able to induce a rapid weaning of noradrenaline, improve the duration of shock or reduce the duration of shock, but also supported the effect on vascular permeability by reducing the amount of fluid to be given both to animal but also to patient, and with a reduced duration of mechanical ventilation. So there was a sufficient rationale to test this drug in a larger trial, having a potential benefit not only on shock, but on lung um, water and also on the duration of ventilation. And so we designed a phase 2B3 adaptive trial using salipressin in the setting of adult septic shock. And as you will see in details, this adaptive trial consisted in two parts, and I'll move on later on. But the primary objective was to demonstrate the superiority of salipressin to standard of care versus placebo and standard of care in the number of ventilator and vasopressor free days up to day 30. We also had secondary endpoints, 90-day all-cause mortality, the number of renal replacement therapy free days up to day 30, and also the ICU free days up to day 30. So the first part of the trial in this adaptive design consisted in enrolling patients with a fixed allocation, a third of them receiving placebo, and that we had three arms of increasing dose of salipressin on one, two, and three. And after 200 patients, there was a first interim analysis. And then the goal was to select one of the three arms if it was showing a potential benefit compared to all other two arms, and then eventually move progressively interim analysis after interim analysis by increasing the, the weight of one of these arms. And in case the third arm, so the highest dose, was associated with a better signal, we had the opportunity to open a fourth arm with a higher dose. Then, after 300 patients, we had a monthly interim analysis with a futility rule to stop eventually the study, but this time to update the adaptive allocation over the course of the study. And after 800 patients, we could either stop the trial for futility, or if there was a signal and an effect with a likelihood to be positive, we could move to the second part of the trial, where the randomization would have been one placebo versus one salipressin dose selected by the uh, different interim analysis. But the study was stopped at more than 800 patients for uh, futility. Now you see that the trial design, in fact, offered 17 interim analysis and none of these interim analysis impacted on the recruitment. And so there was an on ongoing uh, recruitment that stayed stable over the course of the study. So this kind of trial design allowed uh, 
adequate and sustained recruitment, but also a load for efficient testing of hypotheses. Now, this is the, uh, the console slide. This population, for the first time also, was a real-life population. There were limited exclusion criteria. We took patients above 18 with a suspected or proven infection and to have a septic shock defined by the need of noradrenaline for more than five mics to maintain mean arterial pressure after adequate resuscitation. There were limited exclusion criteria. All immunocompromised patients were allowed in the study. We were just limited the exclusion to patients either receiving vasopressin at the time of screening or, of course, if hypertension was not due to sepsis, but also oxygen-dependent patient, as ventilator fee days was one of the endpoints, and also patient receiving active chemotherapy or bone marrow transplant. And you see that the follow-up was adequate as long as we had roughly all patients followed at day 30 and up to uh, six months. You see also the different quotes of uh, exclusion in this slide. Now, the baseline characteristics, I will not go through all details, just to say that by definition, hopefully they were well balanced, which was the case, in terms of comorbidity, severity, cause of infection, and severity score. Just to see that in more detail, uh, the SOFA score was only nine because we deleted the CNS score because of the number of errors in the calculation. You see the mean and uh, the mean Apache 2 score you see that the, the mean dose and the, the median dose of um, norepinephrine was quite significant and that the median lactate was also above two, so they met roughly all the definition of sepsis three, which was not the initial intent by the time we were designing the study. Now, if we looked at the effect of the drug, you see on the left part of the panel in red, the change in the mean blood pressure in the cellipressin arm and in blue in the placebo. And you see that during the first 12 up to 24 hours, there was a significant difference in the change uh, in the mean blood pressure in the treated arm. Similarly, you see the weaning or the reduction of the need in noradrenaline in the treated arm with celepressin compared to placebo. And this was significant up to 24 hours, then the two curves evolve uh, similarly uh, by the improvement of patient uh, in both arm and they were no longer significant. Now, if we looked at the uh, change in the SOFA score and especially the cardiovascular SOFA score, despite the fact that in this study, as opposed to other studies, the fact that you were receiving IMP counted for three points, we had a significant reduction in the cardiovascular SOFA score at day one and at day two in the treated arm compared to uh, placebo. You remember that one of the rationale of the study was hypoxemia, duration of ventilation because of the reduced permeability. You see on the middle part of the slide that the fluid balance was significantly lower in the cellipressin arm compared to placebo during the first 24 hours, so expressing that the requirement in fluid were reduced. And this goes in line also with the needs of steroids to treat shock. And you see that there was a significant reduction in the number of patients receiving steroids for shock in the cellipressin arm compared to uh, placebo. Now, regarding the primary endpoint, being ventilator and vasopressor free days, this slide shows you the way this was calculated up to day 30. You see that a patient receiving in green vasopressor and in blue uh, ventilation, you started to count three days when both were weaned in this patient. In case you had to restart vasopressor during the study, you only started to count three days after once again you had weaned the vasopressor or the ventilation. And there was a death penalty. In other words, if the, if the patient died, even though wean from vasopressor and ventilation, before day 30, you counted no ventilator vasopressor three days. Now, looking at the final results regarding this primary endpoint, we saw no difference in the total of vasopressor ventilator three days uh, in the treated population compared to placebo. The mortality at day 30 was similar in both arms. You see that there was an initial, more rapid uh, weaning of vasopressin ventilation, but this 
was not sustained, and this was different for a couple of days, but for the 30-day endpoint, no difference was achieved in the different, the different um, primary and secondary uh, endpoints. Now, regarding safety, because there was uh, some fear on the fact that celipressin may induce especially significant ischemia in a, in, in a, in a trial design where hemodynamic and, 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 heart and uh, cardiac output had not to be measured especially, you see that the drug was definitely safe uh, in terms of emergent critical adverse events, and especially you had no increase in intestinal ischemia, peripheral ischemia, uh, acute coronary syndrome, and myocardial uh, ischemia. So the safety profile was uh, excellent for this drug, despite the combination of two drugs in one arm. So to conclude that um, among patients with septic shock receiving norepinephrine, the administration of salipressin compared to placebo did not result in improvement in the vasopressor ventilator three days within the first 30 days. Yet salipressin as vasopressin as angiotensin II appear to have a norepinephrine sparing effect without increasing adverse event but also without evidence that their use improved patient center outcome compared to a classical catecholamine based strategy. And finally, this adaptive phase 2b3 design uh, with response adaptive randomization and interim analysis allows unambiguous testing of hypothesis with an efficient sample size without impacting the trial execution and the recruitment. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Any question from the audience? Charlie Sprung, Israel. PF, congratulations on your study. Uh, could you tell us what the uh, instructions were given to investigators as to when they should use steroids? The instruction regarding? giving steroids to the patients in septic shock. Oh, the, the, no, this, this, was, this was free, and this was left to uh, the investigator practice, and uh, most of the time the steroids were given according to the local practice. In other words, sustained shock was associated with more spontaneous um, instruction or prescription of steroids for the treatment of shock. So this is a secondary observation, uh, and not, this was not predefined. Investigator with, were free to use steroids if indicated. Pierre Francois, is uh, the drug ready to be retired? Um, to be honest, no. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not linked with the company, and it's a pity because, you know, this is definitely a potent vasopressor. Uh, we've been probably too ambitious regarding our primary endpoints. Um, in between you and I, if we had selected short term response in terms of hemodynamic parameters and especially the duration of shock, we would have end up with a positive trial. But this is the, uh, the flop of the uh, primary endpoint definition we used and we were probably too uh, ambitious looking at 30 day uh, ventilator and vasopressor free days. Well, that was also my comment. Uh, that would be my comment, actually, because uh, obviously the study did not fulfill your uh, primary and secondary uh, endpoints. Yeah. However, uh, you had to give less fluids and less steroids uh, on, uh, to the patients. And uh, I neither love or hate steroids. I use it when it's necessary, but to give it less is always better. And the yeah. same thing is, can be said for the uh, fluid, because too much fluid is not uh, uh, good for the patient. So I think uh, answering Howard's question from my perspective, uh, there is some uh, future, uh, whether it will be ending good or not, but uh, that's what I thought. Yeah. I I think the other point I would, I would make, um, I think people know over the last year there's been uh, quite a bit of controversy about uh, p-values and confidence intervals, what, what goes in the abstract, what doesn't go in the abstract. Clinical <laughs> trials are remarkable uh, a, a attempts to clarify truth, to get to validity. And w n journals can't summarize the entirety of a clinical trial in an abstract. It simply is not possible. 
And so uh, I think on occasion, uh, one needs to actually read the entirety of a study to truly understand its results. And both this study, as well as the one on vitamin C, where there were many, many secondary outcomes, of which only a few were presented, one needs to read the entire trial to really understand the results. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, and there's, there's an appendix with additional data that you can look at. Yeah. Back in the back of Brussels. Just a, a short question. I mean, most of the effects, especially blood pressure and norepinephrine sparring, uh, vanished at 24 hours. Uh, so can you remind us what was the duration of the infusion of celepressin? And so whether it was a vanishing of the effect or it is because you, let's say, poorly selected the time of exposure to the agent? No, no there, was, there was no fixed duration. You started to wean the IMP, so the, the drug. I mean, this was blind, but you were starting to wean this as soon as you had weaned noradrenaline. So noradrenaline was open in both arms because this was the drug required to be enrolled. And then when you were able to wean noradrenaline, you started to wean the study drug. Excuse me? Norepinephrine doses join at 24 hours. This means that uh, then you would have continued to infuse celepressin in these patients yeah. and that the effect was no more present because the doses were exactly the same in two groups at that time. Yeah, but so you had a significant proportion of patients being weaned from noradrenaline after one, one day and a half. And then, then you don't see the infusion of the IMP on the slide here, but the, the, the weaning process was established this way. Noradrenaline both arm at the start, and then you keep on noradrenaline use in both arm as long as needed, and when you start to wean, and you have weaned completely noradrenaline, you start to wean the IMP. Thank you very much. We will go on to the next presentation.